Thanks, Mark. Thanks. Oh, you can hear me good. I'm a little nervous, but this is straight vodka, so it's really not a big deal. It'll just... Yeah, yeah. This is my, this is my first joke. Are you ready? Welcome to my presentation. <laughs> Does that work? Does that land in Germany? I heard it means like little, small, cute version of whatever the thing was. That, that's like a Mark joke, because he taught yeah. me that. Yeah. Okay, the actual thing, though, is SVG is for everybody. That's my talk. I like I like talking about SVG lately. Yeah, it's pretty good. The year, obviously, is 2014. Uh, on the Chinese calendar, that is the year of the horse. But on the nerd calendar, it's actually the year of SVG. So that's good because you know, if we were to take that horse and we were to render it as SVG, and then we were to use that SVG on all kinds of different displays of different sizes and pixel densities and all that stuff. That horse, oh, it's going to render just beautifully. That's one of the cool parts about SVGs. It just looks really good. If we were to take that horse, I happen to know because I have a copy of horse.svg on my computer, and you look at the size of it, it is 13.9K, a respectable, that's a nice small size image for such a beautiful looking horse, isn't it? And it's not just 13.9K for like the medium size, but then you need like a bigger version of it and a smaller version. It doesn't really work like that in SVG. It's 13.9K wherever you want to use it. Not, I mean, just the horse, right? Not every SVG file is 13.9K. It's just like an example. It's an example shouldn't. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> SVG. I'm glad that lands because I was weird with the words. So, yeah. So it's, SVG has these attributes, and we've covered a lot of them just in those few, first few slides. SVG is flexible. It can it can it can change size very easily, even up. And we'll talk about that. That's kind of a cool thing that it can do. It looks really sharp, which besides designers just liking that because that's kind of nice. It's actually kind of an accessibility feature too because low vision people, it looks so sharp. It uh, works for them. And it's small, meaning file size. It's small, like it's efficient. So that's pretty cool. And because of all those things that SVG is, it makes them kind of a responsive and responsible choice in design. It's part of this conversation of like, let's do a good job on the web on any device. So uh, if you care about that, which you do because you're here, you should care about SVG a little bit. But why do I have to tell you guys that your gas stations are SVG? <laughs> they are. That's right over there. <laughs> okay. So you might be, Chris, oh, some newfangled thing with big promises, but you can't actually use it yet because it's like some future technology. Some people probably feel that way about SVG. It's weird. Some people are like, you learn about it when you hear people talking about it and comparing it to Canvas and stuff. Uh, it can feel new and weird, and I don't know how to use it yet. We're going to dispel all of that stuff in here. It is, that's, not, that's not the case with SVG. Using it can be super easy. It can be as easy as that. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Maybe you didn't know that. I didn't know that for a long time. But some people are like, hey, what about the big guy? You know, like, does it, what the, what's the deal over there? Uh, that's not actually that big of a concern anymore. Uh, this is a website called caniuse.com. And there's actually, there's a couple different ways that you can use SVG. This is just one of them. Uh, but, but if we kind of narrow that down and look at the current version of all browsers, it's green all the way across. And green means go. <laughs> green means uh, that you can use it. The version before that of all those major browsers, green all the way across. The version before that in all major browsers, green all the way across. The time is now for SVG. That is the year of SVG, I'm calling it. That's why the, the conversation has ignited over SVG, is because it's just green all the way across. You can use it now. So pretty cool. And even if you need to go deeper than that in kind of IE8, is a thing that doesn't support it very well. Android 2.3 is a thing that doesn't support it well. It's not that bad, and we'll cover fallbacks in this talk. If you were to open up horse.svg, and if actually that's what's going on here, you might look at all that stuff and be like, oh, what do I look like? Some kind of math nerd? I can't do that stuff. Well, you, <laughs> you don't have to learn it. You don't, like, you don't have to learn JPEG, right? You don't, you're not like, how do you make a horse in JPEG? X plus one dot G. No, you just do it exports as JPEG. What's cool about SVG is that you could learn it if you wanted to, though, right? It's like it looks a bit like HTML. If you want to learn it, you could learn it. You're not going to learn it from me, but you could, you know? 
So that's cool. Uh, SVG can be made from anything vector at all. So if you, can, if you have a file and there's vector stuff in that file, uh, you can get it into SVG. In fact, the V part, it's SVG stands for scalable vector graphics. So the kind of the, the point I'm trying to drive home here is if you can get it in Illustrator, it can be SVG. Uh, and Illustrator actually, you know, Adobe did a good job back in the day and they made it a native file format of Illustrator. If you think of like a Photoshop document working around in Photoshop and then you like export to a JPEG and it doesn't retain any of like the editability of, of that, SVG isn't like that. You don't export SVG from Illustrator, you just save as from Illustrator and it can just be, a, be an Illustrator file, but just be an SVG and have it just be ready to use for the web, which is pretty cool. So yeah, if it can be an Illustrator, it can be SVG. It's pretty to get it. And you might be like, oh, I'm still not sold on that SVG thing, man. It's just for flat design, whatever that is, or logos or something. It doesn't have a lot of uses on the web. I would say that's not necessarily true. That image we looked at earlier of the computers, that's SVG. It looks rather photographic, but it's actually kind of a small SVG. It's just some pretty simple shapes filled with colors and a couple gradients. Uh, 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 SVG is great at gradients. That's SVG. So you, you might not, not everything you look at, you might understand as can be SVG. But it is true that SVG will never replace raster graphics. Raster graphics meaning like, you know, JPEG, GIF, ping, whatever. Those are grids of pixel data like that come off of a camera. This picture of Bob Marley is a raster graphic. It is just a row of... <laughs> is that a joke already? Because the joke is that th when I do that, because that's the actual joke part, raster farian. God, I feel like this has already made it online or something. You get the raster farian, hilarious. This version of <laughs> this version of Bob Marley though is tailor made to be SVG. You, you can tell. Just I feel like everybody has a little bit of intuition already on things that are vector and things that are raster. You can just kind of tell looking at this that that is meant to be SVG. And as a matter of fact, I found it on the web not SVG, which is a bummer because it would be a, clearly a lot more useful as SVG. It would be a lot more scalable. It would be a smaller file. You could do more with it. It would be sharper, whatever. So you, I think you have some intuition with that already. But it's true that SVG is good for things like icons and illustrations and charts and graphs and logos. Gradients is a good example. And then just you know, use your brain. Just use your intuition and, and can, be, can be able to tell which things should be vector and which things aren't. I should say that SVG isn't new, right? It's been around forever. It's actually been around since 1999. And the conversation back in 1999, as is coming back a little bit now, was about bandwidth. was about we're on sucky modems and they're really slow to download. Graphics are the worst things to download. So why can't we instead send across the wire like instructions on how to draw something? That would be way more efficient. That's what SVG was born out of. It just took until now to get all browsers to, to do it. But it was designed for the web. So it's not something that's just getting shoehorned into the web right now. It's, uh, it's coming across OK. There's a lot of usage of it, too. There's a, a guy from Google who like, analyzed all traffic forever or whatever and found that 10% of all page views across the web have some kind of SVG on them. So it's like, wow, it's, it's in use already. I suspect a lot of that is Wikipedia. So how do you get started using SVG? Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's get some SVG. One of the ways that you could do that is to learn the syntax. We already said we're not going to do that. That's it's too hard. <laughs> you could learn Illustrator. Eee, that's a little tough too. Or we could just go on the internet and snag some SVG off some website and use it. Cool. So let's do it that way. <clears throat> I, you know, I like to maintain a, a subscription to some kind of stock photography site once in a while, just because it's kind of nice to have some credits that you can spend on stuff. Uh, here, one of the ways that you can for sure find some stuff that you can ultimately use as SVG is just to search by vectors, you know, on the, one of those kind of things. So you search, and I found this, um, yeah, this cute little clover leaf or something, and I download it, and it's probably an EPS file for whatever reason. And but that will open up fine in Illustrator, and cool. Now I have vectors open in Illustrator, and then you can do whatever you want: get rid of the clovers, change the colors, whatever you want to do. And then this is that point at which you can save as. SVG and it will retain its kind of editability and stuff and that's kind of cool. Um, so then how do you use it? Now, now we have it, we've downloaded it, we've adjusted it to how we want it, we've saved it as like clover.svg and it's on our desktop, right? How do we then use it? It can be as easy as that. 
And a lot of you probably know that. I didn't know that for a while, because I just I feel like the conversations about SVG are more complicated, or you see a lot of weird syntax or whatever. If you didn't know that, that's a pretty good takeaway from this talk. You can just put it in an image tag, and it works. Uh, and it, I think that's confusing, because like that's not a thing, right? You can't do that. So like it just it's it's confusing to people. So if you didn't know that, know that you can put SVG in an image tag like that. Um, if it doesn't happen to work, I don't want to dwell on this, but just put this in your brain somewhere. Your server might be serving it with the wrong content type. Sometimes it doesn't work. It's a one-line fix in an HT access file. Just know that. It's equally easy to use in CSS. You just use it like you would any other graphic in the background tag. Just works pretty cool. So that's the CSS usage of it. That's kind of nice because uh, IE9 even doesn't support CSS gradients, but SVG, it does support SVG, and SVG is easy to define a gradient in. So it's kind of a nice, if you need a lot of gradients on your site, SVG is kind of a good way to go there. Uh, another thing to understand about SVG is that it has a kind of a, it has this thing called the view box, which we're not going to dwell on, but it's kind of like, if you were to open up, this is in Photoshop, that's a raster version of that horse. If you do like, whatever it is, command option I and get the, the image size dialog box, that raster version of the horse happens to be 484 pixels wide by 332 pixels tall, and we just kind of understand that that's the size of the horse. If we were to view it in a browser, it would be that size. Uh, SVG kind of has that too in this view box at before. In, in Illustrator, if you go to the artboard tool, that kind of manifests as the, uh, what's the artboard, I guess. Uh, and it's, th it's those numbers. And if we were to save this out of Illustrator and open it up in a browser, it will have that kind of size to it. But you don't, often don't think about that. You think of it as just it's drawing instructions, right? There is no, it can be any size. And because, I, I don't know, that's just one of the cool parts about SVG is that in raster, if you were to take that Bob Marley photograph and, and make it bigger, we all, I think most of us understand that it's just gonna look crappier, right? Like you don't resize raster up. You, you down only for the most part. Uh, otherwise it's gonna look like crap. In SVG, that's not the case. You're free to go up as much as you want. That's kind of one of the beauties of it. And it's kind of like worry-free resizing, I like to think of it. Doesn't matter what size you render SVG at for the most part. I mean, if you get wicked tiny, it might be weird. But for the most part, you don't have to worry about resizing SVG. So one of those things is you can take advantage of some more SVG stuff once in a while. Like uh, there's a CSS3 thing for background size called cover, which just says take this image and make sure that it just fills the whole background space of this element no matter what. And that's maybe a little dangerous in raster territory because it, it, it's perfectly willing to go up in size. And that's dangerous for raster, right, because it could look gross. Well, in SVG, it's fine. It'll scale up, fine. It'll look great no matter what. So if it's kind of a texture or something in SVG, feel free to use stuff like that, because it's kind of that worry-free resizing. Here's a pretty common little snippet of uh, CSS that you see in uh, fluid design quite a bit. Like, let's say you have a column, and it's 400 pixels wide, and you have an image in it that's, that's 500 pixels. Well, that's a problem, right, because it's either going to hang out of it, or it'll push the thing wider and screw up, or whatever. So a lot of times what you use is max width 100%, which will make that 500 pixel image squish up to be 400 pixels and look good. It might even be ideal to do that, because it'll look sharper in some cases, right? But we use max width, not width, because let's say that image was 200 pixels. We wouldn't want it to stretch bigger. We're always conscious of not making raster bigger than it needs to be, well, if that image happened to be SVG, maybe you would let the max width be whatever, but you would stretch it out. I'm not saying this is like universally useful CSS, but I'm trying to drive home the fact that you can scale SVG up and it's okay, so why not do it when you can or whatever? Just know that you don't have to worry about it so much. This isn't theoretical. This isn't something, oh, you, we could do this, but I use SVG in blog posts all the time. Here's like a cheesy post where I was like rah, rah, rah about box sizing in CSS. This image of the people like protesting border box, it, you can just tell, right, those are vector shapes. That makes sense as SVG. I just did image SVG equals guys protesting dot SVG. And it shows up fine on my blog post. Here's me reading it over syndication through an RSS reader on my phone. SVG looks and renders fine. You can just use it. You can just use it that way. That's a perfectly good... Uh, scenario for using SVG and just kind of everyday usage. And what I thought of when I was doing this too is that I'm like the captain, captain of making typos and stuff in SVG files like that. You don't have to like worry about losing the original if you do it this way because this retains its editability uh, in Illustrator. So because it's rendered on my website, I, I still have an editable copy of it somewhere where I could fix those mistakes, which is pretty cool. I think of that as just kind of a nice little side bonus of SVG is that it retains its editability afterwards. So that's the easy ways to use SVG. And not that this is complicating it more, but there's a lot more to talk about with the whole world of inline SVG, and it's really kind of cool. So there's another source 
for SVG files that I think is worth knowing about. And it's this website called the Noun Project, which it's not just nouns. There's all kinds of adjectives and stuff up in there, but it's mostly just thousands and thousands and thousands of um, icons and stuff, things that represent a word. So apparently it's a snooker. I don't even know how I landed on that one, but it's like a pool ball thing. Anyway, here's an example of me using the Noun Project to find an icon, download it, and then use it as inline SVG. Uh, so I'm like, okay, here's one, cool. I'm gonna download it, which downloads to my file is probably a zip or something. And then within that folder in the zip file is a something.svg. I'm gonna grab that SVG and actually open it up in a code editor, and we're gonna see all that math junk, the paths and all that stuff. I'm just gonna copy and paste it. I'm gonna put it over in CodePen, and all CodePen does is like put it in an HTML document and then render it. Look at it, it works. You don't have to go image source equals whatever. You can copy and paste the actual guts of the SVG and put it in an HTML document and it'll render just the exact same ways that it did before. Now notice that I put a class name on just one of those little elements in there and then I said fill red and I know that's a little tiny, but you can see that little ball. Just one of those little balls turned red. So that's just one of the very interesting things about SVG is that I, I no longer is it just the whole image and the image just is what it is. I now have control over what's in the SVG through CSS, which I think for a lot of us is pretty comfortable and a pretty kind of cool and powerful uh, proposition, if you will. There's three big advantages, uh, one of them being that, the shapes, you know, the, like if you think of like the code pen icon or whatever, the 3D box and a circle around it, those are like two distinct shapes that can be styled and even scripted individually, which is cool because it's right in the DOM as you would, as it were. Uh, it's no, because that stuff is right in the HTML, it doesn't have to, the web page doesn't have to make an additional HTTP request which is nice, it can be a little faster. You know, if, if you focus on performance at all, you know that one of the slowest things a website can do is go get another file. So the fewer times it has to do that, you can take advantage of that. Uh, uh, and what's kind of cool about it is I only have to define that shape once and it, if it just so happens that I need that shape in multiple places, I don't have to like inject that big pile of gunk again. I can just say, hey, I, I used it over here, I wanna use it again over here. And that can be a pretty powerful concept that we'll take advantage of in a minute here. Two is something I just think of as SVG templating. So again, this isn't theoretical. I use it on the current iteration of CSS Tricks. There's these things that are clearly SVG shapes, right? And, and there's a, a couple of situations where they're reused. The code pen is icon there twice. The Twitter birds are there twice. GitHub, the, it's not, it, I'm not doubling up on code there and we'll see how that works in a minute. Kind of the point or behind all this is that websites often need some kind of icon system, right? Here's GitHub. Is there anywhere that they use icons? Yeah, there's a few places. Turns out they use some icons on their site. They need some kind of system to deal with that, right? Because what would be really irresponsible of GitHub is if each one of those was an image tag, even if it linked to an SVG file, there'd be some advantages to SVG, but that's like 100, 100 HTTP requests. Nobody does that anymore because we know how slow and inefficient that is. Uh, so what we often do is kind of try to squish them into one file so we can be efficient and build an icon system around, around that efficient. So let's look at how we might approach that with SVG, and this is super cool, so write this down. <laughs> there, there's, an, there's an SVG block, that's SVG, like, hey, I'm an SVG document, there it is. Then we are like, let's say we, are, we go to the noun project and we download like the Twitter bird icon and the pool one or whatever. We open that up in a text editor in the, in the elements that actually do the drawing. Like maybe the top one is a path of the Twitter bird. Maybe the bottom one is the code pen icon, it's the 3D box, then the circle around it. Maybe that's what those two chunks of green are up on there. We're just defining those shapes in a block of SVG. And then to wrap it around, just so that we can reference each group together, we'll use the G tag in SVG, and it doesn't mean anything, it's a little bit like a div, it just says, I group these together, and I give each one of them an ID so that I can reference that group all together, instead of referencing each path. And then we're gonna put around all of that a defs tag, and defs in SVG just means, I'm just defining this so that I can then use it later, please don't actually render it to the page. Now the, uh, and then you just gotta take this block and just put it somewhere in the body. There was, a, there was a moment in Chrome where you had to put it right below the body tag, that's not true anymore. You can kinda just put this wherever you want to and make sure that you don't 
allow, because the defs tag means don't render it, but the SVG thing will actually take up some space in the document. So display none that, get it, get it away. All I'm doing with this chunk of code is saying, these are some shapes that I've defined. I intend to use them later. Anywhere you want to use that, let's say that little Twitter bird icon, or, and then you just take that block and you just include it in your template probably somewhere so it's not up in your grill. Then you just reference it with this use tag with this funny looking attribute xlink href and then it has a hash link to that g tags id thing. I'm intending here to use that Twitter icon and it will do it. It will just render it right where you want it. You can put that anywhere you want in your HTML document. It's pretty cool. So for example, I could have put it in a navigation tag. There's some anchor links and within the anchor links is blog and videos and then there's an, an SVG chunk there that has that use tag that's referencing something. You may be like, okay, he's got some buttons there or some navigation where he puts an icon next to it. It might be that, but this happens to be the code for the CSS tricks tabs. That, that unusual shape that would be very hard to draw or possibly somewhat impossible to draw in CSS, those, those unusual tab shapes are, is that SVG. I just drew it once in Illustrator. I defined it in a defs block and then I said use, 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 use. But those SVGs have classes on them, tab one, tab two, tab three. And then in the CSS it says tab one fill purple. Tab two fill, well, it's orange. Tab two fill red. Tab three fill purple. So I can use, not only use the same shape over and over, but style them differently, which is efficient and kind of rad. So, yeah, it's pretty cool. So a weird way about that is, let's say you're GitHub and you have 800 icons or whatever. To take that big chunk of SVG and put it in the HTML document on every single page is probably a little inefficient. It doesn't make very good use of browser caching, whatever might bloat your page cache if you do cache it that way. Let's take that chunk of SVG and just move it out to an external file. So remember we have all that stuff. That's the stuff we need to build. We need to build that somehow. It's cool. We're just going to take it all and just put it in a something called like defs.svg. Just put it all into a file. Then, in, when, then when we use, link to that file with the, with the ID onto it. So that's kind of the cool efficient way to do that. And because we can do that, then it's, then it's cached things are set up correctly. That way it's making good use of browser caching that way, which is cool. That's the thing that IE doesn't like, even 11 doesn't like that. So that's a problem and we'll cover that uh, shortly, but that's, that's kind of the way to go. In the future, you'll be able to use the same kind of technique with what's called fragment identifiers. So you'll be able to use the spriting technique within CSS uh, and HTML, which will be cool too. That's not really ready to go yet, but just, you know, it's the future, right? Cool. This whole thing, this is the idea of SVG sprites. So remember those kind of things? That's like kind of a raster sprite, and it was a cool, clever, efficient idea, and I'm sure there's plenty of people in this room that are doing it now. The idea is, remember how it's really slow for a website to go get a file? Well, let's just get them all at once. Just That's the idea of a sprite, so it's efficient, and then you have all this dumb CSS math that's like span class equals icon thumbs up, and then it's like background position, negative 722 pixels, negative 32 pixels to like move the thing into place. Do the thing. It was clever and cool and useful, but, but SVG spreading is cool because it's vector, and we know that vector is cool. You can scale it to any size. It's, uh, uh, there's none of that background position math craziness that's a pain in the butt. And, uh, and you get that SVG, that control over CSS. Each part of the icon it ha can have individual classes on it, whatever, and you can style it from CSS. So there's loads of advantages to doing this way. Not to mention, it's not even that hard. So it's just a really nice system for spriting, I think. Here's an example of some inline SVGs, just to put a point on it. I can say, okay, that code pen icon has a class on it. I'm just gonna change the size of it. No problem, looks still sharp. I can just arbitrarily change the size of it, no big deal. I can target just the outside of it, give it a different color, target just the inside. I can apply CSS filters to it, apply a subtle drop shadow. There's stuff that you can do with SVG through CSS that you can't on any other element. You can apply a stroke to different parts of it. I can thicken up that stroke. I can rotate parts of it with CSS3 transformy stuff. I can decide, oh, I don't have enough room for that border. I'll just display none it. You have all this control over the icon that you wouldn't have in any other way, like using an icon font or an image or whatever else. And taken to the extreme, I have this beautiful looking house. Well, but sometimes the browser gets, uh, doesn't have enough room for that. So I'll get rid of the garage and the house and the, the chimney and the windows and all that stuff. Or no, now I have more room, so I'll do all this more stuff. Pretty, 
pretty cool. You can do all that through the comfort of CSS, too. It's not some fancy, weird syntax that you have to learn. It's just each one of those shapes has different uh, classes on it that you hide and show and do whatever you want. Pretty cool. And all that stuff is possible because inline SVG. Inline SVG is the, is the ticket here for being kind of cool. I like this stage. It's loud. I wrote about all this in the blog post called Icon System with SVG Sprites. So if you want to see more code and more, that's how you learn better. I have that. The idea has been around for a while. PJ Inori wrote about, like, wouldn't it be cool if this was possible, kind of, uh, back in 2012, and even uh, Simurai before that. So it's just now becoming possible, which is rad, I think. PJ actually went on to work on Iconic, which is this little project. Ooh, that made it loud. Which is this really cool futuristic icon set that's all built in inline SVG and it has all these smart class names applied to it already. So it has, that's just demonstrating, look, it has smart class names. You can style it individually. It comes with style sheets that you can apply that then do all this type of fancy stuff to the icons. It's really efficient. Like we're just going to define this arrow once and then you can tweak the positioning of it or whatever just with classes. It's designed so that if these SVGs get really small, they're designed appropriately to look okay small. It has some of that responsive SVG going on, like let's show as much detail as appropriate. This is all kind of baked into one icon set and it gives you fallbacks for all this stuff too. So I Iconic is worth checking out. It's a lot of the, these smart ideas that are becoming possible. Pretty rad. Enough. All right, build tools, we'll talk about that. It's pretty nerdy. Don't sweat like I am. This is rock and roll juice. Don't freak out. Uh, sometimes really simple, simple uh, <clears throat> build tools are just websites that you can use that help you. Icon Moon is a really cool one. Maybe you've heard of it. It got kind of popular in the icon fonts are cool scenario. I, I've, I've often said that how cool Icon Moon it is, and it still is cool. It's kind of like, I want to build a really efficient icon set. I want that one, that one, that one, scroll, scroll, that one, that one, scroll, I want that one. And then you can outline it as an, as an icon font if you want, but it also has SVG output also. And it does this, the exact same system I just showed you. It squishes all them into an SVG defs block. It gives you them all individually in a folder full of SVG files, but then that sprites SVG file up there is them all combined into one SVG file. And then it gives you an HTML file too that has them all in use. So if you want to see them used in the appropriate way, there's a reference for that. So that's, I would call that a build tool. That's, I need a thing to, and you can actually log in, save the project just how you want it. You're not limited to just these icons. You can drag and drop your own SVG icons and make a totally custom set and just use it for the build part if you want. It's a great little web app. Or let's say you're a designer and that's just how you work. You work as folder of SVGs, you know, you have, arrow pointing right or whatever. You have a whole list of SVGs that you've custom built for your web app or you've grabbed from the noun project or whatever else. There's build tools that will help you with that. We don't have all the time in the world, but there's one for Grunt, there's one for Gulp, kind of standard build tools these days that take your folder of SVG files and squish them all into that efficient defs file, each with unique IDs on them for referencing from. That's what those build tools do, which is pretty cool. Uh, and, then, and then Grunticon, which maybe you've heard of, I'm just talking to those fellows this, this weekend, kind of, they're, they're moving Grunticon to this, to the inline SVG system, which is take that folder full of SVG files, make it use inline SVG by default, but it'll also produce PNGs in case you need to deal with the fallback stuff, which you do probably, you know. It'll make PNGs automatically for you and all that type of stuff. And so they're just, just starting to work on it. So keep an eye on Grunticon because it's going that direction, which is kind of cool. So it deals with not only helping you build it, but helping you build the fallbacks as well. And if you're in build tool land, you know, there's this concept of, uh, of uh, optimizing a JPEG, you know, like you're not responsible unless you optimize your raster graphics. So send them through image optim or use code kit to optimize them or whatever because it losslessly does it and there's no reason for you not to. That same kind of thing makes it to SVG too. There's ways that you can optimize SVG, remove the white space from it. You know, sometimes, you know, the like gnarly math, Ethan was showing some, there's, there's gnarly math on SVG too, right? Where like a, a point is like not at one, two, it's at like 1.02, it'll remove some of that stuff that doesn't help your SVG rendering. This SVGO probably will, will, will work for that, which is pretty cool. So just to cage match this out a little bit, because I feel like there's probably people in here that are using icon fonts. Icon fonts is just, it's, it's a spriting system for, for, for icons. It's, it was smart. It's a, it's a kind of clever, cool idea so that 
uh, all the icons on my whole site are just one file, and we're trying to be efficient. That's the whole point of icon fonts, is it's, it just has to request one font file, and all my icons are within it. It's a clever idea, but now that this SVG thing is, is, is rolling, let's talk, let, let, you know, let's put them out. And I've been a, a advocate of icon fonts in the past, but I'm, I'm getting off that. I should probably update that page. There's lots of ways that they can fail, for example. This is, and there's, <laughs> there's some good bulletproof ways to have them not fail, but, you know, over time, I haven't always implemented it perfectly. Here's an example of me just mapping the, the icon font, the way, it, just to back up two seconds, an icon font is, you know, you can imagine a font file, there's an A, and it's styled a particular way, and a B, and a lowercase r, and it has all the definitions, and they're just vector shapes of how that font is drawn. Well, instead of making it an R, just make it a Christmas tree. <laughs> and it will render as a Christmas tree, right? It's clever little, you know, you'd call it a hack, but that's just how browsers work, so I guess I wouldn't call it a hack. But then you, so I've mapped in this case what should have rendered as like a chat bubble or something. It, the font failed, and instead it rendered a number sign. That's a sucky way for something to fail because it means nothing. It's poor accessibility visually. And it just so happens this is a fairly modern Windows phone that just doesn't support at font face. So I screwed up in implementing them here, and that's a pretty big fail. This is an example on CodePen where I was trying to be smart about that. Like, I'm not going to map it to normal characters. I'm going to map them to what's called the private use area in fonts that nobody can use. So if it doesn't work, it just doesn't render at all, or we can make it be some fallback. But then people would send in, the, like, that gear icon is a rose. Like, shucks, because Apple's like, I'm going to use that private use area for Unicode. Thanks, Apple. That's cool. I wasn't using that or anything privately. <laughs> So here's the chart of destiny comparing these two things for real. Like, I was just venting for a second about icon fonts, but here's like a point-by-point -point comparison uh, when you're comparing an icon system with the two. If you use an icon font, those icon fonts are also then subject to the anti-aliasing rules for text in any given browser, which varies and can get weird and apply weird blurring and stuff. And uh, in SVG, it's just, SV, it's just vector and it just renders and it's typically sharper. Uh, you get the CSS control. Sure, you have some CSS control in an icon font. You can change the size, the color, apply a text shadow, stuff like that. With SVG, you get all that, and you get more, because you get the stroking and SVG-specific stuff. So you have even more, C and not to mention individual parts of a single icon you can style. It's just better in SVG. Positioning for, for icon fonts is the worst, right? Because it's often, if you're doing it in the most accessible way, it's a span and a pseudo element on the span, and then the box in the browser that that creates is subject to word spacing, letter spacing, and line height, and just the design of that glyph itself, and like kerning information and stuff. Like if you put outline one pix red around an icon font, it's like, hmm? It's just, some, it's, it'll just be somewhere around that icon. And if you want to line that up with a button, you're going to end up in like position relative, top negative one pixel territory, which always pisses me off. So I hate that. SVG is just, it's the size that it is. It's like an image. It's just that is the size of it, and you position it how you will. At FontFace can fail in all kinds of weird ways. You know, I had one on Chop Talk where we started using a CDN, and then the CDN is really at a different subdomain, and Firefox doesn't like cross-domain font requests for some reason if it has the wrong headers, and you're like, <clears throat> or you're in a Windows Phone 8 or something, and it's like, we decided to not support at font face on this phone, so all your icon fonts fail, or the CDN failed, or, uh, God, I thought of some more, but there's all kinds of ways that an at font face file can fail, not with SVG, it's just, if it's, if it's supported in the browser, it renders, because it's right in the document. Uh, the semantics, the, you'd get none pretty much with an icon font because to do it in the most accessible way, you have a span and a pseudo element on that span or whatever, there's no semantics implied there. Was there, there is semantics implied with an SVG. For one reason, you can imply the semantics with an ARIA role, and not to mention SVG semantically just says, I'm an image. That's pretty good semantics, if you ask me, and the, the meaning of semantics. Uh, SVG, there was an article just out recently about the accessibility of SVG that says, it's good. Use the title tag, use the description tag, use a proper ARIA role, and just use it, period, because of how, rend how sharp it renders. That's good for low vision folks. Accessibility of SVG is just better, whereas in icon font land, you have to be very careful that you don't screw it up. You have to make sure that it's not, you know, the right, correct thing is read in screen readers, and the f if the at font face fa fails, it loads something else and stuff. It's, it's tough, accessibility-wise, with icon fonts, very easy with SVG. 
the ease of use and talking about build tools and stuff. This is kind of a debatable thing, but I feel like the, the, the state of SVG makes this a lot easier. Like the icon fonts, I need to use something to build that icon font for me. I can't do it with code. I don't know how a font file is constructed. Whereas with SVG, I often just do it manually. Grab the path, throw it in the defs block, give an ID, do it. I can, I, it's just, it seems easier to me. Uh, the big win for icon fonts is that it's IE6 up and SVG is IE9 up. And there's more browsers in the world than that, but those are probably the big ones that we're all thinking about. If you need to support way, way back, icon fonts is still a winner, but in the, in the future and, and, and whatever, the, everything else SVG is better at. So it's pretty cool. If you, if you choose to go down the icon fonts, thing, definitely read this filament group article because it, it just covers it. It's just they figured it out the way that you can use icon fonts and not screw it up. And it's a little complicated. There's some hoop jumping, but it can be done. Here's an example. On CodePen, I switched all the icons over. The, and the, these were in the middle of me switching it over. I switched over our little code expander icon things, and they're just, they're lined up perfectly in every browser. They're, they're in the exact same position. They're sharp. They look good. Even in IE, fine. There's no problems at all. They're right where they should be, and they look good. In the, uh, in the footer, I had some icons, and I, that's a little blown up JPEG, so I'm cheating a little bit. But they just were fuzzy. They just looked like crap comparatively to the SVG one. So there's some real benefit that you're going to get out of this right away if you choose to do it. So let's say about the fallback thing. Let's say you do want to use SVG in the various ways that you can SVG. How do I deal with IE8, Android 2.3, stuff like that? Uh, remember that there's different ways that you can use images on sites. And one way is just kind of to enhance something. Let's say you have a button that says Twitter on it, and you put the little Twitter bird next to it. You don't have to deal with a fallback for that, because if it doesn't work, it's still a button that says Twitter on it. So. No big deal. Uh, so uh, one possible fallback is to do nothing in some cases. Uh, but if you know that you're using, let's say you're using SVG as an image, image source equals clover.svg or horse.svg that we looked at earlier, uh, there's one library called SVG Easy. It's just a couple of lines of, of, of JavaScript code that goes and looks for anything it will find horse.svg in your HTML, and that's me just initializing it really quickly and saying that my fallbacks are in PNG, that it's on you to everywhere that you have an SVG file also have a PNG file, and it will flop that out in the, H, in the, in the HTML and request the, the PNG version. It's really simple. That's a nice, easy kind of fallback way to do it. It will probably result in multiple requests for files and stuff, but hey, it does the job. It works. It makes sure that you're your site has accessible images on it. So in a browser that does support SVG, it works. In a browser that doesn't, it's, uh, it'll use the PNG. That's IE 7 or 8 or something. So all right, there's another thing called picture fill that just happens to work for SVG too. And let's not dwell on the syntax, but there's a way that you can avoid double requests by using picture fill and using a source attribute with the, with the SVG and, and, and a fallback. And that kind of handles it for you. So if you're into picture fill, which you should be, that works too. Uh, in CSS, there's kind of a clever technique that requires nothing. See that bottom line there, background image, and then it listens. Am I over time or something? <laughs> Shut up. <clears throat> comma none is just multiple backgrounds, right? So that's a thing that's not supported in IE8, but is supported in IE9. So IE9 or IE8 will be like, I don't get it. I'll use the line before that. So that's just kind of a natural, in the IE canon, this works kind of great. It does kind of break in Android 2.3, which does support multiple backgrounds. So if you, if you need an alternate way to deal with that, most of you have heard of the Modernizer Library, which is a feature testing library that tells you true or false if things are supported or not. You can always use, the, use that information that Modernizer gives you to just handle flop outs too. That's perfectly acceptable. Uh, or for inline SVG, and this is how Grunticon is actually going to go, is that they have divs and, and if the, it detects for support, and if the support's not there, it, it shoves in like a PNG fallback of the SVG and then kind of hides. You just do some hide show stuff with Modernizer. It looks a little complicated, but it's just display none and not display none and other stuff. This is cooler, though, and this is some new stuff. So remember, when we're talking about inline SVG and making it work in older browsers, that's still the topic here. Remember, you do use and you link to an external file. That's a pretty cool way to do it because of caching and all that stuff. Uh, what this does is it detects if the browser, and this is called SVG for Everybody by Jonathan Neal, it detects if, if, if the browser supports that use thing or not, which we know doesn't work in IE 9, 10, 11, which otherwise do support SVG. It'll go Ajax grab 
the paths and stuff, and instead of that use tag, it'll replace the use tag with the guts of the SVG. So it just makes using use with you where it says sprite map.svg, that's the super cool way to use inline SVG. It'll make it work in IE too. So it's kind of like a small, pretty lightweight library that allows inline SVG usage to fall back. And then there's some crazy stuff that I don't even feel comfortable talking about, but it's like, oh, don't worry, we'll just turn the SVG into Canvas and Canvas will turn it into PNG and PNG will render and everything. And you know, there's plenty of stuff you can Google that I'd be like, wow, cool. So if you're in the, if you need to make your charts work, that's a possibility. Uh, there's plenty of um, things to make and edit SVG, right? A lot of us are know and are comfortable with Illustrator. I think Illustrator does a pretty good job with it. It is, I think the only way you can get Illustrator these days is paying monthly for the Creative Cloud thing. That's not everybody's bag. If you're into one-off costs on the Mac, there's Sketch, which I hear good things about. Cheaper than that is one called Web Code. Cheaper than that is one called iDraw. These all speak SVG natively, and then there's a free one that works on everything, Linux, Windows, or whatever, called Inkscape, which I mostly hear good things about too. So there's plenty of software tools you can get to work with SVG. I think that's kind of important. You need something, right? You need something to, to even if you're largely just snagging stuff off the internet to do, often you'll need to edit it up a little bit. You know, if you use SVG as image or whatever, then you don't have the CSS control. So if you need to make a circle green, you got to make it green in some kind of software or learn the syntax, which bleh. <clears throat> so let's just end this by just looking at some fun stuff SVG can do so we can get extra stoked about it before we're done. Here is a big drawing. It's got a bunch of cool SVG stuff on it, and it's responsive that each one of these things has classes on it so that as the browser window gets smaller, play, buddy. Some of it hides, some of it moves, some of it shifts around. The little guy blinks. See the blank? That's pretty cute, right? That's just, that's just SVG at work. It's just like move this one over here, uh, you know. Make dude blink, <sighs> display none, cool stuff going on. This is the same kind of thing in this blog. It has this fancy SVG header. Doesn't your, in, doesn't your SVG intuition just say, oh, that's probably vector up there? Because it's just simple shapes, right? It, it, it looks like SVG, it is SVG in this case. In that case, it didn't something, there was a, some kind of other subtle animation here. This is a, just a nice little blog design that has that ripped paper thing. You see how sharp and nice that ripped paper looks? That's just a background image that's SVG, so it scales and looks sharp and great on retina, and it's a tiny file size and all that stuff. But it's just a background image, just looked in there. And it's just cleverly designed such that the end of the tear meets the front of the tear, so it can scale as wide as it gets and stuff. A trick that you could use in raster as well, but you're free to do that with SVG as well. You can do it the same kind of way. In fact, if you wanted to do sprites the old school way, or even SVG, and you lay them all out next to each other, you could do that with SVG too. There's nothing that uh, SVG can't do that raster can do, really. Here's a, a website for the CSS conference. See these bricks? I'm going to play this movie. It does this kind of cool intro thing where the bricks fall and they're all different colors and it forms the word CSS. You'd think, oh man, that must be a tremendous amount of code. But if we dig in here, we can find that each one of these little bricks that makes the Legos is one of those use tags. They defined what a Lego brick looks like once then they just use it over and over. And that inspired somebody on CodePen to like figure out how they were doing it and apply different animations and stuff to it. It's this really kind of efficient way that the you know, cleverness of what you can do with SVG is not done yet. There's a library by Adobe called Snap SVG that, among other things, helps you animating it. So this is an ad that they built for SVG. It helps do that kind of cool poly thing in the background that's fairly easy to do in Snap SVG. Uh, yeah. That's the kind of thing that you just kind of programmatically explain what you do happen in SVG, and then it's scalable, it scales to any size. You could actually use, and I did use when I ran this ad on CodePen, Ethan's, that, that um, intrinsic ratio thing. So it's in a box and it scales just like that movie scaled. You can totally do that with SVG. Um, Code Drops is a really cool blog that has all kinds of great um, SVG tutorials on it. Look at this like shape and watch how it animates. It like moves up like that. That's not like some big div that rotates or something. Those are actual individual points in that SVG curve and those are being animated. So if we dig in and look at that, it's actually in, in, in the dev tools and look, it's actually animating the, the polygon, it's animating the points in there. A, a snap SVG is doing that. So that's kind of cool, like morph a shape to another shape. That's the kind of futuristic web thing I think we're going to see more and more of. There's a thing called SVG masks. This is an animation of an SVG mask. I think this is a pretty impressive demo where 
kind of builds in these iPhone shapes. And all it is is just a, a shape mask that's just kind of moving to reveal additional parts of this, changing some opacity and stuff. It looks quite impressive, but it's, it's, technically it's not all that complicated. It's just the moving around of some masks. SVG has this ability to, I know that looks raster, and it is raster. You can put raster in SVG, which is weird, but it's a whole language, so you can just do stuff like that. And there's a whole set of filters that can apply to SVG content that you can also apply to the HTML content in this way. And it, it's filters that you maybe haven't even heard of. I mean, blur is a pretty obvious filter, so you can blur stuff. And this could be SVG content as well. Uh, but there's ones like make it little blocks of color randomly. That's an important one, right, guys? <laughs> anyway, SVG is awesome. There's all kinds of cool stuff about it. I'm tired of talking about it, so let's just be done. Thanks, everybody, for listening to that. Thank you.